everyone. I'm your host, Dominique. And I'm Christina. And we are the Connected in Glass podcast. This podcast is meant to be an educational and inspirational podcast about glass art for all listeners. A love of glass art connects people of all walks of life and in all generations. Let us celebrate this by getting to know each other. Each interview will have three sections, getting to know this week's artist, diving into more detail about their particular form of glasswork, and going into the deep stuff that isn't usually openly discussed. These are meant to be real life coffee table discussions about hopes, dreams, and aspirations. We hope that with every episode, you'll be left with a sense of connection, a new perspective, and maybe a boost of creative mojo to tackle your next aspiration. Today, for our very first episode, we're going to be talking to our friend, Anne Conlon. Anne is a real estate agent in Massachusetts, but she also has over 50 years of glass experience. So we're really excited to share her story with you all today. For this episode, we jump right into interviewing with Anne Conlin, where she's going to tell us a little bit of her life and how she got started in glass. I live in Massachusetts. I live in Tewksbury. It's about 25 miles northwest of Boston, um, close to the New Hampshire line. Um, I am in a relationship with my husband. How about a 40-year relationship? It's been 40 years this year. Um, and, um, we don't have any kids, um, and, um, yeah, just live kind of a, kind of a nice, um, nice life doing kind of what we want to do, which is an awesome place to be. Um, you know, because we're not really tied down with kids. We, we used to have dogs, but, um, just a lot easier to move around without them, you know, travel and, and do impromptu stuff. Um, much as I would love to have a dog again, but um, anyways, what I like to do um, is I like to travel. Um, I love the beach. Um, so when we travel, um, I like to include the beach a lot of the time. Um, love to go out to dinner. Um, as you know, Dom, <laughs> we've had dinners out together. Um, what else do I like to do? I like to paint, um, haven't been painting much lately, but when, um, when I do paint, it's usually watercolors, um, which, um, kind of, I think in a way, um, has some mixture with glass just because of the transparency and luminosity of the paint. Um, um, yeah, so, oh, um, what I do to make a living, um, although my husband would really like me to be retired and just, um, spend my time doing the things that I really like to do, but I kind of like what I do for a living too. Um, I've been selling real estate for, um, close to 40 years now, um, and right now I'm just really doing it for um, my past customers, clients, personal referrals, um, that sort of thing. Of course, with the pandemic, it's been kind of interesting to um, doing that. Um, things have kind of just uh, readjusted. Um, but that's what, what I do for a living. Um, and I sometimes look at people who do glass for a living and um, it just blows my mind at how hard people have to work. Um, and I, I um, remember being with you, Dom, when we were in um, Corning for a conference um, at the Corning Glass Museum. It was the gas conference. And I just remember you being totally stressed out um, when we were at that conference together because your um, furnace was on the fritz. And if I recall correctly, your pot ended up cracking the pot that holds the glass inside the furnace. And you had to have somebody um, help you with, um, with uh, 
shutting the furnace down because we were what six and a half seven hour drive away um and this really had to be taken care of um right away and i i just remember you being in my car and just like totally stressing out and being at the point of tears because you have this um this thing that you have to um, be attentive to all the time. Um, so, and, and then I watch how hard you in particular work to, um, to have your business move along. And, uh, and it's not much different from other people who own glass studios. And even those who do glass just for a living and might rent space somewhere, um, it's just really difficult being an artist and um, selling your work for um, what it actually is worth um, and just making a living and feeding yourself and um, paying rent. Um, so it kind of blows my mind and I'm grateful um, that uh, I didn't choose that path. Um, I'm jealous of you sometimes. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Are you? I, I appreciate the beauty of your speech because it was all true. <laughs> it's so hard, <laughs> most certainly. Um, but but it, it is. It, it's true that it gives you um, some freedom when you're not dependent on, um, on making a living in glass. And I, Christina, you make a, a good part of your living in glass, right? That's my full life as well, yeah. Yeah, and and I think for me, um, because I have something else going on, and I, I mean, I do enjoy it, but um, I enjoy glass too. I just never have that pressure of um, making something that maybe I'm not totally into making just because I know it sells and I'm not like... Um, underneath any um, pressure to do production work because, um, because it's something that's going to sell. I, I have a certain freedom about um, what I choose to create and I can do it just for the joy of being creative and um, for my own pleasure um, rather than someone else's pleasure or what I imagine might be someone else's pleasure. Um, okay, so you, uh, you've you been doing your job for 40 years, but and you do glass for fun, but maybe it sounds like you haven't been doing glass seriously. So can you tell us about like how serious you are about glass? <laughs> like when, tell us about how, when you started doing glass. Um, okay, so yeah, so I, I think that you already know, Dom, that um, it's not the case that I'm not serious about doing glass. I'm very serious about doing glass. You know that, right? No, I know that. <laughs> I yeah, know. I know you do, but I know <laughs> that that um, Christina really doesn't know me that well, and probably anyone listening to this um, doesn't know me. Um, so when I was a kid, we used to go to the beach, right? So I'm back to the beach. Um, and we used to go up to Hampton and there was a guy who did um, torch work. I'm imagining Boro, um, now uh, borosilicate glass, um, on a torch. And he would like do this um, stitched work to make like little figurines and wishing wells and birds and things. And I, I was always fascinated and I would stand at the window in his shop and just watch him for hours on end. Um, and so when I was 16, um, my father went to a historical society meeting in the town where I grew up here in Massachusetts. And he came home that night and he said, you would really like this. Um, apparently there was a guy there who was a glass blower. And I, I have um, found out a little bit about his history, but he was from a, a line of uh, Bohemian um, glass blowers they were, it's, it was an itinerant family who went from place to place um, uh, blowing glass. And he made hollow forms in soft glass. Uh, so it was all torch work, crossfire torches. Um, 
And I ended up taking lessons from him when I was 16 years old. Um, and, um, you know, I was a kid, so, uh, so you know, I kind of had the interest of, of a kid. I wanted to do it my way and not his way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, um, so I always liked art. Um, and I ended up um, going to Mass College of Art. Um, and they didn't have any glass there at the time. And I uh, picked a major in fibers, but um, uh, they ended up building a glass furnace while I was a student there. So I switched my major over to glass and um, ended up working from the furnace. Um, I went to Pilchuck, which is a glass school out in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I've since, uh, I, I, somebody said, when did you go there? And I'm like, um, that was in the seventies. Um, so it was actually, uh, I found my acceptance letter to Pilchuck. So I was there in 1973, um, and, um, blue glass there. Um, but it's kind of interesting, like in the, in the era that it was, um, women in the glass studio, um, were not really accepted. Um, so it was kind of a, um, a difficult thing to, uh, to move through, um, being a female who wanted to blow glass. And then um, once I got out of school, um, there was really no place around to blow glass. Like now you can find glass studios all over the place. Like I, I can probably name um, a good half dozen within an hour or so of where I live. Um, but back then there was like no place that you could um, blow glass. So I ended up, um, I ended up getting a job um, as a scientific glass blower, um, which is kind of interesting. I, I was making what they call um, graded seals. It was just, um, um, joining soft glass to really, really hard glass. It was quartz crystal actually. And, you know, you have to go through, um, like different, um, different grades of glass, like from, um, soft to a little bit harder, to a little bit harder, to a little bit harder, and finally to the quartz. So I did that for a while. Um, then I did an apprenticeship in a stained glass studio for, um, a couple of years and um, ended up doing, the, the artist I worked under um, did a lot of commission work. Um, we did some contract work for Lynn Hovey Studios um, in Cambridge, but um, she did a lot of like private commission work. Um, and some of the windows we made were big. Like I, I remember um, working on a project that was uh, four panels and they were one design. And I actually went to the installation, but it was four panels and each one of the panels was um, four feet by eight feet. So they were um, very, very large panels that got installed in the chapel at the Waltham uh, Hospital. Um, so, um, so anyways, then I, I just kind of, went off, started selling real estate, ended up getting married, um, didn't do too much artwork um, until I started painting again. I mean, I, I always painted from the time I was a kid um, and through college, um, but kind of gave it up for a while. I don't know why I had that like hiatus, but I just remember like picking up a paintbrush for the first time after um, probably um, 10, 12 years or so and feeling paralyzed. Um, but, um, but then, you know, I, I just found my center, I guess, again, and started painting in earnest um, and did that for, um, for a while until um, until I took a class, it was actually a fusing class. And I don't know what made me take it, but it was at Worcester Center for Crafts. And, um, 
and somebody dragged out a torch and I was like, wow. And um, they started making beads and I was like, wow, I could do that. Um, so that night I actually hopped on the torch and um, so then I just started making beads and one thing led to the next. And then all of a sudden I was standing at a furnace again. Um, although I, you know, I do still really, I think identify as a flame worker. I'm really a torch girl more than, um, more than a furnace person. Although I, I love going in to um, the hot shop. And okay, so this is perfect segue into the next question. So like, describe your style of work, like maybe give us a visual of like your workspace where you work. I know you work at home and then you travel to other studios and work. Um, like part of your process is usually alone, right? And then part is usually with a team. So maybe you can like try to like verbalize a description of how about that part of you. So, <clears throat> So my workspace is a little corner in my basement. Um, and um, I, I met up with a lot of resistance from my husband who didn't want um, a torch in the house. He was kind of like afraid, I guess, that I'd burn the house down. Um, but I haven't done that yet. And, and the torch has been in my basement for a lot of years now. So yes, a lot of my work is um, solitary. Um, I, um, I have a, a little national torch, which is, um, you know, for anyone who does glass, it's a little bit bigger than a minor burner, but it's not like a, a big torch. I work in soft glass. I don't really um, do too much in Boro. Um, I just prefer the feel of the soft glass. Um, so I have a torch, I have a kiln, um, which is basically just for cooling. Um, so when glass is hot, it has to cool slowly. Um, otherwise, it's going to crack. It's like when your mother told you, don't put a glass in the oven because it's going to crack. It's the same concept. So I have um, a torch, a kiln, um, some tools. Over the years, I've... Um, I've gotten a couple of little warming ovens, a hot plate, um, just little things that I use here and there. I have a hood for ventilation. Um, and my setup, actually, the, um, the hood is just an old stove hood with some halogen lights in it. Um, and it's vented to the outside. And I open up um, a window to get makeup air. Um, I have my propane outside, um, just piped into the basement. Oh, and I used to use um, oxygen concentrators like breathing machines to make the oxygen to mix with the propane gas. Um, but I bought an oxygen generation system. So I have tanked oxygen now. I have two. Oh, you, you're looking surprised, Dom, like you don't you Fancy. didn't know that, right? <laughs> I, know. I have I have two tanks, so while I'm using one, I can be filling the other one. Um, so it's basically like once you like shoulder that initial expense, you can make your own oxygen pretty cheaply. So um, that's that's like basically where I work. It's kind of nice that it's in my house because I can. Um, I can make glass while I'm in my jams and I just put on the radio and um, listen to whatever kind of music moves me at the time. And um, yeah, so that's nice. Um, I suppose you want, want me to describe some of the stuff I've done with you, Dom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is part. So maybe talk about like what gets you creative in glass and like where you go with it. What your work inspires your work. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's interesting that um, that the material itself is magical and it's inspirational to me just to melt some glass. Um, but you know, in terms of like my work, um, I guess I like pretty things. I like jewelry. Um, 
I've always worn jewelry. So when I make beads, um, I wear a lot of my jewelry, um, you know, because that, that just gives me pleasure um, to have on something that I think is pretty and it's something that I made and it's something made out of glass. Um, but, you know, when I think about my paintings, um, I mostly what I paint, um, surprisingly enough, is um, the beach. Um, and it's not just the beach. Um, and, the, you know, I'm going to talk about the luminosity, too, because I love um, painting low tide um, because low tide leaves all those nice pools of water like just really like um like razor thin pools of water on the beach that reflects the uh the sky and um so um so I like that and there are always people always people in my paintings um so it's as much about the people as it is about the beach and what people are doing I've always been a people watcher. When I was in college at Massat, I used to work um, an overnight shift and I would get out at seven in the morning, go home, get on the subway, go downtown and like sit with a coffee and just watch people as they were going back, going to work in the morning. So, um, so I think, um, the human condition is really what motivates a lot of my work, um, you know, and the work that I've done with you, Dom, in glass is a lot of it is figurative work, although some of it is decorative too. Um, just, you know, the flower pieces that we've done together um, with drawings on the glass that you've actually blown and then I'll draw on it. Um, so that's like the, the pretty stuff that I like, but um, what really moves me is people um, and how people um, respond to one another and the things that they do with one another. So usually like if I'm painting, I'm not just painting one person, um, I'm painting people together, showing some kind of interaction. And it's not about who the people are, it's about what they're doing, um, which I suppose kind of like ties into who they are, but, um, but it's more about like what, what they're doing and how they're interacting together. Um, that kind of is um, very inspiring to me. So I think people that haven't seen your work are probably wondering how the heck you depict the, that emotion or those in that in glass. Can you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to explain it, Dom? <laughs> well, I'm look. Everything that's coming out of your mouth is beautiful. So just keep talking. <laughs> oh, you know what? Yeah, we haven't talked in so long, and it's so. Uh, it's just nice to um, be on this call with you, um, you know, for you to say that to me. Um, so like how, okay, so how I do this and, and it, it really was when I first met you that I started to do this literally um, that first week. Um, we took a class, I didn't know Dom and uh, I, how many years separate our age Dom? Well, ooh, <laughs> no, don't worry, we have an editor. Beep. <laughs> it's a lot of years that um, separate us. And we were at um, Snow Farm, which is like a craft camp for adults so up in the Berkshires. And I don't know how they, they figured this. It was an improbable pairing, but um, we were roommates. Um, and I, you were in your 20s, I think. Um, probably, yeah, you had to be in your 20s, right? Because I've known you for about eight years. Um, and I was in my, mm, I'm not going to say. <laughs> A few I'm years enough, older. I'm old enough to be your mother. <laughs> um, so, um, so they put us together and I, I, we just kind of clicked. And I had no idea what this class was about, but it was um, taking um, 
flame worked objects like things that you make in the torch and combining them with furnace class. So I think it was the second day at the class of the class that kind of hit me like, um, oh, this is what this class is about. So I, I started to do a couple of drawings of just like faces, like almost like little cartoony faces with expressions on them and, um, and put like two um, people together and like kind of exaggerated expressions as to how they were looking at one another and just a gestural kind of stick drawing of that person. So, so what I was talking about with um, painting, it's, it's about what they're doing, not necessarily who they are. Um, and that's what these pieces are like because the, um, the people themselves in, in the um, drawings were um, just stick drawings, but very gestural um, stick drawings. So you knew exactly what they were doing and um, kind of that with the uh, combined with the expressions on their faces um, kind of told a complete story um, in one little snapshot. Um, so yeah, they're kind of um, very uh, cute um, little faces. A lot of them surround um, um, love themes. Um, and um, yeah, I put a lot of hearts on them and uh, then I did that piece for you, Dom, when you um, opened up your new shop. Um, we yeah. actually made that together, but I came to your studio with all the, um, the parts and pieces. God, we had a good time that night too. Um, you know, with uh, there was Dom um, blowing glass, kind of a stick figure Dom. Um, and she had her dog with her and- um, A blow yeah. pipe. I'm yep, sure. blow pipe they were and um, all the hots um, above you because I, I knew how much you love doing glass and um, and I was very excited for you like moving into your new um, workspace and um, yeah and then we did the, the Terrapin um, logo on the back of the piece so that was a fun piece. When when did we do that piece, Dom? 2015, was it? Yeah, must have been. 13? I can't so remember. So just to like further describe it, Anne goes on the torch in her basement and spends hours and hours and hours making what we, we call elements. Like, so instead of making a bead, she'd make like a flat face of a character. And for every flat face of a character, she'd have a backup and another backup because the glass likes to crack a lot. So if she's making a scene and she loses one face and the whole thing's over. Then she goes into a bigger glass studio. She heats all those elements up. We make a big vessel, like a, a large base. And then she'll slowly put all of those elements on and then give them their stick figure emotions. So when she says love scenes, there is a whole scene that she did at Snow Farm where it was a guy proposing to a woman. I think the woman was turning away because she was not having it, right? You want to tell me about that? It was a whole like comic <laughs> series of different vessels all lined up that told a story. Right, right. Yeah, that one, um, I, I think uh, it, that he must have done something to really... Um, really push her away um, because he was on his knees and he just had this very worried look on his face and he was holding a hat in his hands and she had her arms folded across her chest and her face was looking away from him um, and her eyes were downcast almost like she was um, tapping her foot and um and saying you know what get away from me and this guy was just hot broken um and i had all the hot was in his hands but i had um i think three hots like surrounding his head um because he was just so um 
like forlorn um, and wanted her love so badly and she wanted nothing to do with him. Um, I'm surprised that you remember that piece, but- um, oh, it, That was a good series. Yeah, it was a very, that piece in particular was a very emotional piece. Um, yeah, so, so yes, um, and that's where the team comes in, Dawn, because uh, thank you for um, picking up on that, that I make all these flat little elements to, um, to bring into the studio. So they're all cooled um, in my house and I put them in a little box and bring them into whatever hot shop I'm working in. And it really does take a team to um, assemble one of these pieces. So Dom would, um, be on the blowpipe blowing the piece. And I would be there with, um, with the torch kind of um, putting the pieces, uh, the little elements onto the piece. But you also need someone to assist with opening up the kiln and um, keeping some of these pieces warm. So the night we were doing the piece for Terrapin, um, we had um, a bunch of people there at that point. And, there were more than um, just the torch that I was holding. There were other torches that were just keeping those elements warm on fire brick. We were taking the, the whole fire brick um, with a bunch of little components out of the kiln. And, uh, and so there were a lot of people helping with that piece and keeping it warm. So it's, it's fun. I mean, the teamwork is fun. Um, Working alone in my own shop is like a nice little space to get into in my brain, but it's very exciting to be with other people and to put a complex piece together. So I also think, so that whole series of work that you do is really, really cool. But also, can you talk about the work that you do with Gary? Because I think that's really cool too. <laughs> So Gary is my husband um, and he is an engineer and, um, and never had any interest in artwork. Um, and then he met me and so he was interested in me and he got sucked into the vortex. Um, and um, so I started dragging him around to museums and craft shows and um, and I think he was interested in a lot of the process. Um, then went to Snow Farm um, with me a few times and took some classes in metals. And um, I was at a, um, a meeting for an organization I belong to. It's called Be Designer International. And there was a woman speaking um, program that night and she teaches chain mail at Metalworks in Waltham, Mass. And um, she had a book and I thought my husband might be interested in this chain mail book because a lot of chain mail has to do with mathematics and you know, aspect ratios and stuff. So, um, so I bought the book and I brought it home for him and he didn't really think much of it. And then six months later, he picked up the book and he made a little bracelet. And then he made this like crazy um, chain mail collar and I, he just blew me away. And uh, so he's been making chain mail ever since. I mean, he was making chain mail last night. He, um, he sits with a tray in front of him and he'll watch TV. And he said, it's just very soothing, almost like knitting. But anyways, we've done um, we've done some pieces together with um, my beads and um, combining them with chainmail designs. And he's always uh, looking for ways that he can combine the glass with his chainmail. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of nice to be able to have uh, to be in a relationship with someone where you can just casually bounce ideas off one another. Um, he paints some now too. He does Chinese ink brush. Um, and, uh, and he is um, really somebody that I trust to ask, what do you think about this color combination? What do you think about this design? Even though he's not had a lot of formal art training, I think just 
um, being around me and um, the people that I like to hang out with and, you know, work, he hears about work that I admire. I think it's taught him a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I trust a lot of what he says to me about my own work. I think it's special that you can have that relationship together. Mm -hmm. Great to buy and work together like that. It works for me. <laughs> <laughs> the work he does is really cool. We started an Instagram. It doesn't have anything on it, but I'll steal some photos. I also love the fire hydrant piece that you did with George Kennard. Yes. She did a, a really large vessel that she designed and George helped her make it. And it's a vase that looks like a fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I, I'm going to give Dane Jack some um, credit on that too, because I think um, Dane, uh, Dane helped on that. He um, made the little cup things that go on the side. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that one, it, huh? It's a good piece. It's complicated. It's complicated. Um, but uh, again, you know, it's, it surrounds that whole, um, the element of love um, because they were actually um, two dogs that were in love with one another. We did a little, um, a pink um, French poodle and then a little um, blue boy dog and um, yeah, puppy love. Um, so, and, and again, you know, it's like, it's like drawing from the human emotion because those dogs were, um, were humanized in that piece, honestly. You know, it wasn't just, uh, they weren't animals, they were human animals, which sometimes on uh, our pets really, we humanize them. <laughs> so yeah, that was a fun piece. That was, and again, it's really exciting working with people. Oh, and the other thing that I do want to mention too, is like when we're putting these, um, these components together, these different elements that, you know, we, um, I bring into the hot shop, the things that are all pre-made, there's always a drawing. And um, it, it always starts with a drawing. And it's a lot of times is a scale drawing. So um, so I'll put things on a grid so I know in my mind like how they're going to fit on the piece and then the drawing is usually on the floor um, and um, whoever is in charge of the blowpipe um, brings the blowpipe over to the bench. The drawing is on the floor so I can use it for reference as I'm standing over it um, putting the elements onto the piece. So they're, they're always um, very well thought out. Even when I make beads, um, you know, I go through um, phases in like what I want to do and um, the design is thought out before I start. And each one ends up differently um, because they're um, individually made, they're handmade, but, um, but it's never just, I sit down and grab a rod of glass and just start. I always know like in my mind, like where I'm going with it. Although sometimes you have to let the glass go where it wants to. And that's, that's something I actually learned in painting. Um, I was in a class some years ago and the, um, the instructor walked over to me and she was looking at my painting and um, and she said to me, okay, Anne, now it's time for you to let the painting take you where it wants to go. Um, and that I'll, I'll never forget, you know, when she said that to me and she's some, someone that I'm still um, friendly with. She, she lives in Maine, her name is Adrienne LaValle and she used to teach at St. Anselm's and she used, to, um, she used to invite me up to St. A's sometimes to paint with the kids up there. Um, but, uh, but that's one of the words of wisdom um, that I got from Adrian. Um, yeah, so. So, okay, how many years have you been doing glass? Like probably a little over 50 now, right? 
Yeah. You went to Pilchuck in 73. Okay. So in your 50 years of glass, if you can culminate, like what words of wisdom, I mean, you've already shared so many thoughtful things, but I know you're kind of an open book. So like if you could Pat tell younger Anne, teach her something, what would it be? Hmm. So yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, hmm. because there's so many um, great things that came out of the path that I took. Um, and then I can look back and say, oh, I wish I had done this and I wish I had done that. Um, so, so another thing I, I sort of learned in painting um, from another teacher, and I won't say who this was. Um, it was a it was a an interesting lesson for me. Was um, the day that uh, I was in class, and she used to play music, and she used to um, like say you you need to feel this. Sometimes she'd read poetry, you know, and talk about like feeling the painting, and um, that was cool. And then um, like within two minutes, she was talking about how you should never do a green painting because a green painting isn't going to sell. Um, and I thought, well, that's kind of confusing. Um, you know, you have to feel this, you have to want to do it, you have to be a part of your work, but don't do that because it's not going to sell. So I, I guess I, I, have to um, go back to um, where I was in the beginning of this conversation and just say that I am grateful to have a way to sustain myself um, and to be able to do the work that I want to do rather than the work that I have to do. Um, and I think, I think that um, if you really want to live as an artist, you may have some other things that you have to do in your life in order to sustain yourself. But for me, um, just to be a total um, person, my work has to be about what I want to do. Um, and not what somebody else wants me to do, which ultimately I think is the way that we should all be living our lives anyways, is to do what makes us happy and not so much conform to what makes other people happy. Um, and I suppose if I were gonna say like what I would um, do differently because I'm happy with what I've done, um, but what I would do differently is um, maybe not to have taken that hiatus from, um, from myself and my life actually, um, and not taken that time off of artwork that I did in the, like probably in the, um, mid to late 80s into the 90s. And I miss so much um, of the studio glass movement in the United States. Um, yeah, I, I probably like that would be what I would look back on and change. But ultimately, I'm happy that I established myself in um, a career that I really enjoyed, which allowed me the freedom to um, just be joyful about my work and not be stressed out about, um, you know, was my work going to sell? Do you have any like comments or thoughts on um, like how it's such a male dominated um, activity and like maybe things that you've seen change that have gotten better or just for other women or people that don't um, view themselves as men in the <laughs> male dominated arena? 
Um, it, it blows my mind how many women are in glass right now, and particularly in the hot shop, um, because it was at one time so um, male dominated. And I think you know this, Dom, that I have a real soft spot for young women who are in glass, um, because I, I think that, um, that a lot of them are warriors for um, having um, broken through those barriers. Um, yeah, so a lot of things have changed over the years. Um, I think particularly in the United States, I think sometimes when you get out of the US, uh, from what I've seen, it, it um, is a little bit more male dominated, but um, I think as we become more and more of um, a global community rather than a local community, um, you know, those, those barriers continue to be broken. Um, I think it requires uh, not only strength of conviction to work in the hot shop, but I also think that it requires uh, um, a lot of um, body strength, which I mean, uh, I think that a lot of men are a lot stronger physically than women. Um, but again, it's where the teamwork comes in, you know, and, um, and we all have our, we all have our abilities and things that we're stronger at. So, um, you know, I see a lot of the men actually picking up and doing um, physical things and women um, maybe, um, you know, they, they have just as much capability to design as the men. So um, teamwork has become um, a, a major part of working in the hot shop. Um, does that kind of answer like yeah, Zena, any questions, comments? Um, my biggest question, I guess, as someone who also, I started mostly plant working and then migrated myself into the hot shop. And as someone who's constantly kind of doing both, how do you shift your brain space from, I'm working by myself in the corner of my basement to being in a big studio with probably at least a dozen people all helping you work on one piece. <laughs> oh God, that's, um, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, don't, don't you really think Christina that a lot of what you do in, um, in the flame shop is kind of meditative. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had the, um, I had the great fortune of being able to travel to Taiwan, um, about four years ago. And I remember being at a, uh, at a yoga retreat, like up in the mountains, like far removed from anywhere. And, um, there was a lovely woman there. Her name was Tai, and she was so excited that there was, uh, someone who spoke English and she, um, spoke broken English and um, we had tea ceremonies with her and um, she was a yoga teacher and I had some videos of glass and she had never seen glass being made before never and um, she was she was dumbfounded at just um, you know videos of me flame working and she kept on saying to me this is yoga this is yoga um, so, you know, it's, it's like a real meditative space, um, that like for me with the music on and usually the music for me is not um, disruptive. It just like goes into the flow of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then when I would like, um, I'd be working on getting all these little components ready to do a piece with Dawn. Um, we'd have a date set that I would come up to the studio or anywhere that I'm, I'm going to do one of these um, pieces where there's going to be um, a, a group of people and a team working, you know, I'd get myself like all um, cranked up and I'd have like all these butterflies in my stomach for 
like a week before I got there. And, you know, do I have this? Do I have that? Make sure you have the drawing, make sure you have enough components. Um, and I would always be like almost a wreck, you know, when, um, when I was up, I'd have to like really um, get myself I almost like peel myself off the ceiling to get into the space where I could actually do that. Um, you know, because the, the execution of the piece goes so quickly, like you'd spend hours and hours getting all those little elements together um, and doing that in that meditative space. And then all of a sudden you're going to make this, this piece out of all these little things that you've been working for so many hours on and that whole piece is gonna like take maybe an hour, you mm -hmm. know, an hour and a half. And maybe, and this has happened, Dom, maybe the piece falls on the floor and shatters um, and it's all over. So, um, so yeah, that's a, a really um, difficult switch to make. I mean, it's not like, it's not like just going into the shop and like, um, like making a vase or making cups, you know, you've got so much more invested in it. And maybe that's why um, I would get cranked up and, and like not want to mess it up, so to speak, you know, and then there are certain things that are out of my hands. Like, you know, if you're working with a team that Dom is, in charge of the blowpipe and you know if if the heat is like too much the piece collapses and if the heat isn't enough the piece cracks so there's just uh there's so much more immediacy i think in the creation of the big piece yeah i think it's a hard kind of a hard um switch off to make christine it's even though it's the same material it's just like such a different process. It's a totally different world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you working mostly in Boro? I mostly work in Boro and then I also work in the hot shop, but mostly just with Dom. So that that to me is very difficult too because um because the feel of um, borosilica glass and the soft glass from the furnace, uh, they're such a different animal. So it must be even um, more difficult for you to make that crossover. Yeah, for people who aren't familiar with glass, soft glass in, in the hot shop will move super fast like honey and it stays hot for a long time. But when you work with boro, it gets hot and then almost immediately out of the flame, it becomes a solid again. So it is, even though they're both glass, they're totally different at the same time. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a huge difference. And, you know, I'm, I know, I, I don't know if this is uh, like too technical to talk about, but the glass that I use, it's all about um, the chemistry of the glass and the um, the rate at which it expands and contracts. So the glass that I use in making beads is 104. The glass that um, Dom uses at the furnace is 96. And, and when I make the little elements for pieces to use in the, um, in the hot shop, I switch over to 96 so that the glasses are compatible. But the borosilicate that Christina is using is 33. So for me to go from 96 to 104 isn't a big deal, but for Christina to go from 33 to 96 is, uh, is a huge difference. That was pretty yeah. nicely explained. Yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Anything else that you can think of that you wanna add? You did pretty good. You went over way more than I thought we could cover. <laughs> you Come went through all of the categories for us. It was really nice. Well, really, yeah. <laughs> Dom, you know me. You know it's hard <laughs> to get me to shut up. <laughs> and actually loves going in the hot shop because then she can talk to people. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I, and I think it was 
good that like I, I looked at your questions and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad that we could just wing it and talk, you know, rather than having something prepared. Of course, if you guys keep on doing this, you're going to have like other people that are going to show me up, but <laughs> you'll always be number one. <laughs> I, I'm your first victim. Yes. And you did pretty good. You survived. I, but are you happy with, uh, with what we talked about? Yeah, I think it was absolutely perfect. Honestly. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And I'm glad I got to get to know you. I know, I know. Yeah, you know, I said to Dom, who's Christina? But I think we've met one another before um, when you first started there, I think. you Were were you working in the office with Anne Marie some? I'm everything. Where? <laughs> everything at the same time. <laughs> I mean, do you remember me, Christina? You look familiar to me. Yep. Um, and I've seen your work a million times. <laughs> a million? Like like the few pieces that Dom has? I've cleaned them a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Everybody's going to smile and I'm going to take a picture for the end. A picture of the screen. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, God. Three. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much for all your time, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Connected in Glass. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information on the artists we interview and for updates on the podcast. You can find Ann Conlin's work on Instagram at Ann Conlin Glass. A N N C O N L I N Glass, all one word.